those of you joining me, uh, we'll go and ask some questions, answer some questions here in a little bit. But this is the new improved system. So, larger antenna. This is us live streaming, hoping that it's actually transmitting correctly right now. I'm using a WeBoost system, and I'm going to try and use that here in the mountains in the summertime so that we can do this with, uh, you know, a little bit better backdrop, some beautiful areas, kind of let you in on uh, what I'm experiencing while I'm experiencing it. So, uh, I want to talk about a little bit of survival. It is a bit of a mail call. We've only been out for a couple weeks since the last live stream. Mail still is slow down here in South Texas right now. But I've gotten a couple donations. Uh, I can read this a little bit. Patreons are coming back in, which is awesome. What is it? Uh, Udo Seebeck. And I'm going to just murder these pronunciations. Uh, I, I grew up on the border. I know Rodriguez and Gonzalez, but Seebeck. Uh, donated six bucks and Paul Goldburn he donated 25 bucks and that'll go towards more leather and more buckles and things where I can build for the BSA so that the horse program continue on and uh, so that y'all have more adventures in cooler places so the further I can go with a horse you know the more fresh I am and the more able I am to make the videos in those truly remote areas so it works out pretty well. Uh, in the picture that we just showed you, uh, the cover photo here, there for the video, you have the rattlesnake, and that's a rattlesnake, rattlesnake that I've had taxidermied for 20 years now, 20, 25 years. I know that a lot of folks have been wondering about the rattlesnake bite, uh, kind of follow-ups. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I got bit by a rattlesnake a year and a half ago, two years ago, like two years ago. Um right here and that was with me standing it came up struck off the side and injected me with a single fang um that resulted in me being the, on the icu for three days three horrible days six vials of crofab um had a had a gofundme started up and a lot of folks poured money into it and it took care of most of the expense but overall it was a horrible horrible experience um and I had, I had really no idea of what to expect. I had trained people on snake bites my entire life. I had been through dozens of first aid trainings, but most of those were, were incorrect or misleading or incomplete. So within the first 40 minutes, uh, I was feeling a lot of pain. It just started burning and it started feeling like somebody had taken a, a hammer and crushed my bones up and was still crushing them. Uh, the pain was getting the point at almost an hour where I was insistent about the morphine. So you can imagine me going, you can hurry up with the paperwork, I, I would really re appreciate some morphine. Uh, so it, it became a lot harder to concentrate until I got that sweet, sweet morphine. Um, they tell you not to run down trails, not to get panicky, not to freak out, just to take it easy. But if you're in a remote area, you need to start trekking immediately towards your destination where you can get a vehicle or get on something that can get you out of there. I would go ahead and pop two, three uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, whatever you have for pain relief, because by the time it starts kicking in, you're going to start needing it. At the two hour, two and a half hour mark, I completely lost consciousness. Didn't expect that at all. Completely passed out. Woke up a day later throwing up for days on end and, and passing out again. So, if you're not moving down a trail or moving to an area where you can be transported out of there, then you might have a, a search and rescue team actually having to pull a, a limp body out of there. So if anybody's ever done search and rescue, uh, SAR, backboards, uh, Stokes crews are not fast. And unconscious people don't get out of places very quickly. So as far as you can move with your own momentum, with your under your own power, the better off you're going to be. So, uh, tons of pain. Get ready for that. Don't stop. Just keep on getting out. Uh, last thing I want to mention, well, two more things. As far as the extractor sets go, they're trash. As soon as it, it stung me, I squeezed a little bit. I was able to get a little bit of that nasty amber fluid out. Then that's it. You can't get any more out. If I was to sit there and fumble, 
even if I could get an extractor out 10 seconds later and put it over the wound, I'm not getting anything out. If I take a Trank gun and I shoot you, you're out in a few seconds because the chemicals hit you and disperse throughout your body very, very quickly. Happens with everything you do. You have certain sugars you put in your mouth. Your body starts using them within seconds. Your body's really good at transporting these things. You're not going to get it out of there. So think about that. So dart gun, trank gun, rattlesnake venom, it isn't going to help you at all. So don't even mess with it. Uh, secondary side effects. For 12 months, I was unable to thermoregulate which means that I would just be sweating all the time for no reason. It was like 20 degrees outside. I had some first aid trainings that I went to anyway and pushed through, but I was just sweating, disgusting, unable to, to do any kind of temperature regulation. Uh, not cramps, but inflexibility from my hips down. My hips would no longer fold up correctly. I don't know how to explain that. Uh, I wasn't able to do... I wasn't able to do uh, Indian style, a leg cross, and I'm, I'm very flexible. I do that all the time. It would not let me compress my legs to do that at all. Uh, within a month and a half, the hardness, because this hole became a plate right here, a very hard muscular plate, it started to soften up. Something better. Oh, you okay, bud? He's done. He's done. I'll have to find something better for uh, him to sit on one of these times. So the muscular plate went down after a few months and that healed up all was well. So at about 14, 15 months, I started loosening up as far as flexibility again. And uh, I think within a week and a half, I was able to do Indian style and move around. So it just kind of unlocked all at once. But that's that's it as far as the snake bite's concerned. We went to, this, to the uh, doctor's office for my eyes a week after the snake bite. And kind of worried about what what it might have caused. But we had all the drops to get the pressures down. We had all the meds to keep everything down. And the doctor didn't have any concern with the snake bite as far as having optical repercussions from my other issues. So that's where that is. So that's it. That's it. Uh, are, they, are they getting antsy and wanting to know answers yet? Or having questions yet? That's... <laughs> that is Huck. Never mind. Yeah, he's he's done. He is done. All right. So while folks are are filtering in here and trickling in, uh, that's Shauna Hansler, my wife, back there talking, and she was mentioning Trip. Uh, Trip has a channel. It's called Trip on Two Wheels. He does all kinds of motorcycle stuff. If you want to, if you're up for motorcycles, I mean, I think everybody kind of has something in their heart for a motorcycle. He's got an awesome channel out there. He actually brought a scout troop down to the property a few months ago and has some really good kids. So if you want to show him some patronage and throw him a like or subscribe, I'm sure Trip would appreciate that. Uh, this knife. This knife right here. This is the one that everybody is wondering about. Uh, the latest person that commented on it on a video was Mark Merriweather. And Mark Merriweather, if y'all don't know, is is part of Foraging Texas. He is uh, he has a lifetime, a lot more information than I ever will on what you can forage out here in Texas as far as food, uh, useful med medicine, medicinal plants, just useful trees, plants, everything. And the guy's got an amazing channel and one of the biggest resources as far as what you want to do or or. How to identify anything out here in Texas. So Mark Merriweather was talking to some folks, having a live stream, which he has an awesome one that he does in the mornings, drinking his coffee. And he was talking about this knife. And I've been begged over and over again to explain this knife and what it is about this knife. Where it came from. This is, as it's explained to me, is kind of a gag gift. This was given by a great, great uncle to this property. So we used to have a big gun rack and had all the hunting guns up there. This used to be just a hunting piece of property and all the family would come together. And this sat up on the mantle with an old, you know, by the time I came around, it was old, with an old uh, staghorn sheath. And it was called the neck chopper. And my family would 
terribly come out and use this thing and hack necks off of animals they had shot. Uh, if so, y'all have seen with the HD stuff, kind of the cuts back here and the dings back there. That's from somebody in my family tree taking a hammer to the back of it, putting it up against a neck, and hammering it through the uh, through the backbone there, through the spinal cord. So, I'm related to them, but I don't have to claim them all the time. And that's what happened with this for decades. Uh, about, 20, about 20 years ago, I adopted it. I started sharpening it in the blind, and then I started riding for months on end uh, as a trail guide back in the Davis Mountains and horse, and this came with me. And I started using it more and more, figuring out what it could do and what it couldn't do, and it just became a very iconic knife. It went from the neck chopper to Bob's Bowie. Now, this knife is 13 inches long. It does have some dings on it, which will take me all of five minutes to sharpen out, and that's because... One of those uncles came out a few weeks ago and shot a deer. And uh, I went ahead and helped him out cleaning the deer. This is his first deer ever. Uh, and I cleaned the entire the entire deer with this giant knife, uh, which I hadn't done in quite a while. So it's, it's kind of a funny thing to take a knife this large to skin a whitetail. But it was cool because it is sharp enough to do that, and it made quick work of it. So 13 inches long, it does have the stamp of original Bowie on there. I think most of y'all can't really see that through the patina, so that's fine. It kind of looks cheap. It does say Italy back here. I've had a lot of folks ask me, is this a Solingen? Is this a German blade? I don't believe so. The Solingens are much shorter. I mean, uh, Brie has one, my daughter Brie, and it's this big. It's like a toy knife. Uh, so their little bitty buoys are are tiny, tiny things. This is rounded out a lot better. This thing's a lot more sturdy. And it's going on almost 60 years old. I had not found one like this. I'm looking for replacements. I went ahead and bought another buoy with the same profile, same length. Uh, it, was, uh, it had wooden scales over here. But it didn't quite have as much metal out here. It was just a tiny bit thinner. I mean, you would have had to have calipers to figure out how much thinner. But that little bit of thinness took down the weight in the blade, and it really didn't have the follow-through to chop through trees like this one does. So the weight out here in the front of the blade, the dynamics of that blade, even though it might look the same, you might think it'll work the same, there's a lot of balance and a lot to these blades. So this one has enough weight in it where it's really able to go through and follow through and act as a bushcraft knife as well. Uh, that being said, y'all will always see this. This is my favorite knife ever. Oh, man. Assuming it fits in the sheet that I made for it. The new project blade is this. All right. Y'all see that thing? Right? This is going to be the project blade. I'm going to put it back together. It looks like it might have been in a Halloween skid or something it's got some red spray spray paint on it i'm gonna take down the handle a little bit make a little bit more custom grip sharpen it up but this is going to be the new bush blade i don't know if y'all can see the thickness here this thing is heavy this is called a cotillion and it's pretty much a world war ii medic sword and uh, i got to touch one of these things about a year ago i was extremely impressed by it and this is going to be what i'm going to be able to build with some of my larger projects could I? Could I go cut down trees and build things with my buoy? Sure. Should I? Absolutely not. So this is the key to the city, really. This is going to be an amazing thing. It will not go with me on horseback because it is several pounds, but y'all should see this thing making a cameo on some of the episodes here in the next couple of months. So I'll, on this channel, Barely Survival, I'll go ahead and do a rebuild thing on this, recondition this knife, Put it back together give it some real love it's got some history behind it and it's time to show y'all what this old model can do uh, i want to kind of sell a few people on this it ain't an axe it's not a hatchet but effectively it's going to play the same role as one would so i'm excited about it it'll be functional it'll be helpful in some ways uh, last thing i want to mention 
I had a couple guys contact me about leather parts and pieces and tools. So uh, Mr. Pope called me up, and he's going to be sending in some uh, leather shop tools and a few scraps. Has arthritis. Uh, older guy that's uh, been doing the leather leather working for quite a while. Can't quite do it anymore. He's got lots of other things he does. Awesome guy. But he's going to send us some of the tools so that I can outfit some of the Wranglers on trail and so that I can get more of these projects done. I had a couple other people contact me wondering what they could do. I had one guy question and ask. I had talked about saddle strings and horn wraps and what kind of what kind of leather I'm needing. I don't need to buy saddle strings. I need to buy the leather that I can make saddle strings out of. So I need to go buy Tandies and find out what weight leather this is. You'll see how thin that is. So I will take something like this, a big half hide side of it, and then I will cut it down to saddle strings. And saddle strings hold your saddle together. They also hold on all kinds of stuff that you tie onto your saddle, but they hold the saddle together. And the horn wrap is going to allow a lot of the old wearing on these horns to just kind of be reconditioned. It's a really good way to wrap around it and to take care of it. But I use something Something like a strip right here. Set your length. I take my big giant hides and I pull and draw knife all the way down them. So I'll take a six, seven, eight foot long cow hide of whatever diameter, um, whatever thickness leather that I need. And I make my own straps, my own horn wraps and my own saddle strings so that, I mean, it, it goes a long way if you make it yourself. And that's the plan. So. Tandies is where we're going to go for that because I really don't have very many options. If y'all do or have any ideas, uh, yeah, send them out to me. I'm out here in South Texas, so whatever I can get delivered out here, that's what I'm looking for. So buckles, leather, and tools. As, uh, if they break ever or wear out, uh, that's, another, that's another phone call, and, and I guess Amazon or somebody else sends it out here. But uh, that's it. I think... You want to ask some questions, guys? Yeah. Uh, will you continue to upload to your main channel, or is this your upload channel now? Uh, so, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting the last few months. I think everybody's been going through COVID. I did lose some Patreons. It's completely understandable because um, everybody's hurting out there. We're hurting out here. So it's, it's affecting every, every aspect of our life. I did have a network TV uh, show come out. And some celebrities come out and work on the property for a while. And that took up uh, more time than you might have imagined. It's very efficient. It was cool to see behind the scenes and see how all that was done. I can tell you about that here in a few months when I'm released from an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. But uh, that was a huge portion of where my time went. Uh, I'm now putting together the programs. I'll be filming tomorrow morning, bright and early in the morning, doing more primitive stuff. I know that a lot of y'all indulged me with the horseback stuff that I showed. I've been wanting to do that for like 12 years. So thank y'all for putting up with me uh, when it came to that stuff. The chicken coop build. Uh, getting some brownie points, making a chicken coop for, for Shauna. I might as well make a video on that, right? A uh, couple things like that. It wasn't really what most folks on the channel wanted to go for. And I have literally hundreds of, of ideas and, and things that I want to teach y'all, techniques and skills and just weird insights into what I've been through and, and how to get through stuff out in the wilds that is going to be posted onto the Bob Hansler channel. So that's coming up. More stuff to come. I know the steak on a rock was kind of a, kind of a, a throw out there, not primitive, but uh, uh, weekend warrior trick pretty much. You know, a camping hack. So we're going to be back to the purely primitive stuff here tomorrow. I'll have that edited up in, in three or four days. Uh, weather willing. Weather willing. So this channel was kind of de designed and developed. The idea behind it, we'll see what it becomes, as kind of an outreach for you folks. If y'all have questions that y'all want to ask me, uh, this will be easier for me to be able to communicate with y'all and, and get things through. It's also kind of a testing ground. If there's stuff that y'all want me to try out that I'm not sure is going to fly, 
or don't know exactly how YouTube or y'all will, will like it or not, that's going to be something that I can post here. Uh, I know that a lot of folks just want to see a lot more of Huck, and that's that's in the works. We do have a Huck cam that he can wear, <laughs> so there is a, a Huck episode that will be coming out here in the next month, but uh, this gives me that avenue where if a hurricane comes through and there's 10 days, I don't have the ability to go film out in a hurricane, then I can get a little bit of content out there. I think some of you, if, if y'all been watching the channel, the algorithm, the all mysterious algorithm on YouTube, it likes y'all to put the thumbs up. It likes y'all to comment a whole bunch. Just keep on throwing comments on there. It likes the amount of time y'all spend on a, ch on, a, on a video. So if the video is 10 minutes and y'all watch it twice, you've given me 200% or of the watch time. All of those things matter as far as getting my channel and getting the views up so we can afford to do this. But lately, the last eight, nine months, y'all might have noticed that some of the videos were awesome, but they didn't really go anywhere. YouTube seems to be penalizing folks that don't post once a week or twice a week, just flooding content everywhere. So what I'm going to have to do is start to really push the content and get a bunch of smaller projects out there so that hopefully that I get back in the favor of the algorithm gods. So if y'all have any insight in that, if y'all have any ideas of what's going on there or any other ways that I can uh, attract their mercy, <laughs> uh, that that would be appreciated because it, it has suffered. I'm pretty sure I know what to do to get the views back and we'll be working towards that. What else you got? The scales are going to be the same. Uh, same scales on that, that big cotillion. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sand it down and make it where, it, you know, you kind of have the finger depressions where it holds in your hand real well. Um, I don't like the lacquer where it becomes slippery if it gets bloody or, or anything else on there where the knife might come out of your hands. So I'll probably sand it down, get back to the normal, the normal wood grain, infuse it with oil. I've got quite a few different uh, stains up here that I can use on it to kind of prematurely stain it until the oil takes effect. But that's going to be the plan is to kind of give it more of a, a naturalistic coloration. That is my timer real fast, guys. Hold on. Oh. There we go. Got it on a power saver mode and a motion sensor, and I've still got to get the motion sensor aimed down right now. So, we're slowly getting things wired up. Slowly. Um, will you be doing any in-person talks or presentations this year? Man, I wish. Um, so, we were, we were in the plans. We were talking to Texas Parks and Wildlife Department um, and some of the game and fish places. We had done some talks for a few folks. And they really, really appreciated what I was talking about and, and liked the presentation a lot, which meant that I had room to improve it. Put a slideshow, everything else. I love getting out there. I love talking to folks. I love meeting people. Uh, because after a few months of being out here and talking to Huck, I, I get to be a bit more social for a while. So I want to, once everybody starts getting vaccinated, I would like that to open up once more. Um, I suppose probably late spring, especially in the fall, I'll be contacting and reaching out to those folks again to start doing that once more. Tentatively, mid to end March and beginning of April, I'm going to try and put it on the calendar here in the next couple of weeks. But there in West Texas, I'll be heading to the Davis Mountains to start working up on horseback and working on the backcountry trails, clearing trails, building up the remote camps and getting everything supplied and start taking people out horseback. So if you want to go out and trek with me, I'll do it two and three day treks uh, through the spring. Call them up, $80 a day. I'm, in, I'm, I'm included in that fee, plus the horses included in the fee, all the tack and all the food. 80 bucks a day is insane. Um, but I want to have two work weekends, uh, two extended work weekends, once in March, once in April, 
at least one of them I want to have 40, 50, 60 guys go up trail, guys and gals. Uh, people that actually know how to do something. I, I need people that are handy. Um, I'm not I'm not one to exclude anybody. I can train anybody. I mean, even if you can dig a hole, I'll take you. That's that's enough to qualify for being able to do something. Um, take you up trail three or four miles. Have all the food and supplies dropped off by mule. So we'll have four-legged mule coming up with wranglers dropping food and supplies. Throw the hammocks up and put together a remote camp once again. So this is gonna be the beautification for the last 15 years. It's needed a lot of love. Uh, corrals need to be built up. Uh, fire rings need to be built up. Solar system needs to be reinstalled. A structure needs to go up as far as a uh, structure over where the saddle racks are and a whole lot of other camp improvements. So just pretty much a two to three day complete restoration of an absolutely gorgeous camp that just needs a little bit of love. So 30, 40 hands, stuff will get done quick, and uh, lots of stories will be told. Lots of good times, lots of good campfire stuff, and uh, amazing food. So I will get that calendar out here in the next couple weeks, get that finalized. And if y'all want to come out and have, man, I live for this. This is the, the most amazing time is to find a bunch of people out on the trail and to go fix some stuff. is to be in these beautiful areas and have this happen. If you want a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go out and hang out with some amazing people and really expand your tribe, this is your opportunity. So West Texas, Davis Mountains, it's six hours from where I am, and I'll be there for months and months all the way to August probably. But uh, that's, that's where I'm going to be all about is the Desert Mountains. So come join me. Come join me. Come join me. Do not miss out on it. No, oh, God. All right, so uh, I've been putting that off. If y'all want to come in and and work the Agave Grove, come on down. Uh, so most of these came from like Terlingua area or in the Davis Mountains. They're the Blue Agave with a couple variants. And I started them out here all the way down here in, the, in South Texas where the humidity is. We don't get a lot of cloning or pups off the ones in the mountains or the desert. They usually grow just from seed. So maybe you see a pup off of one out of every 50. A pup is one of the babies that comes out from underneath the plant. Here, with the nutrients and the humidity, I'm getting like a dozen pups off of every plant. So I have 200, 300 babies that I need to go ahead and pull out right now. At least. Yeah, at least. Um, and I kept up with them last year. But I am going to have to put in more rows. I'm going to have to go in there and pull them, pull them again. They're insane, and these agaves are over my head now, which they only get a little bit, a little bit over waist stabby in the desert mountains. And some of these leaves are this wide now, at least this wide. So I'm going to go ahead in the next two weeks and do the agave baking because I've got one picked out. It is absolutely humongous, and it's time to show y'all how that's going. But uh, if you have humidity, they are proliferating like crazy. They, the, the growing profile is nuts. They're, they're growing like weeds, actually. So we'll see how that goes. It's, it's like a bamboo almost. It, it really could get out of control quite quickly. So we'll see. We'll see, we'll see. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Um, I'll have one out before March, hopefully, if the, if, if the, weather, if the weather works. Um, shoot. We're going to do one more down here starting in the spring, and then I'm taking 30 of my traps to West Texas in the Davis Mountains. I let a snake, a snake wrangler mess with them this last season. And he caught some absolutely amazing, amazing snakes uh, down around the base camp and in some of the side canyons. So we're talking Trans-Pecos Copperhead, Trans-Pecos Banded King Snake, Texas Night Snakes, all kinds of beautiful, exotic, strange, a lot of them venomous snakes out in the Davis Mountains. So between March and uh, the end of May, I'm going to be snake trapping 24-7 on top of the other videos I'm making. I'm just going to leave them out there set in good spots. 
and y'all are going to get to see some truly different things. So get get ready for that. I'm looking forward to that. As soon as June, July come in, when I'm out on trail all the time, I'll pull all the snake traps in and go ahead and basket them up because I can't be away for six days at a time. I don't want snakes to die. But it ought to be, it ought to be interesting because I, I think I know what's out there in the dark. I think I know what, what wiggles around. But just the few days that he put these traps out, uh, we saw things that we didn't expect in, in these areas. And so I, I can't imagine what's going to happen whenever I put that many traps out and see what uh, what gets inside of them. So I'm excited about that. I'm very excited about that. Oh, so I, I'm, I assume he's talking about survival, survival storage. Yeah. Storage, camps and stuff. So, so if you're going to do survival in South Texas, salt's going to be a big one and, and you're closer to the ocean. So you could probably trade with folks around the salt water, of the ocean to get the salt. Um, certain kinds of foods lend themselves to pres preservation, even in high humidity. So, Okra seeds grind up to be okra flour. Uh, yucca seeds grind up to be, well, yucca flour. Uh, same thing goes, uh, we just talked about the agave, agave grove. That is in the ground uh, for the last three years of its life. It is ready to be pulled at any time. So you leave it alive until it's time and it's ready. Same thing goes for your wild onions. You can plant those out there and you'll know where they are even if they're dormant. You can dig them up. Uh, various things that you can do to make sure that your land is uh, not only productive, but is able to store the food. I say this because South Texas is absolutely horrible when it comes to trying to maintain food supply. If, if I was to come across a, an unsecured food stash that, that, you know, flour that's open, barley, things like that, your best bet it, even if you do have some containers you can seal it up in, is to eat all of it, is to cook it down and keep on eating it, and you store it inside of you. You make yourself the storage vessel because a few bugs get in there overnight, you've lost it all. A mold gets in there overnight, you've lost it all. It is, it is a very tough thing out here in the humidity to, to preserve something that's not alive. So you keep the pig alive until you're ready to eat it, you take the fish and the clams, keep them alive until you're ready to eat them. Same thing goes for the plant, plant life. Keep it alive as much as possible. If you have to, eat as much of it as possible because it makes it very hard to preserve anything down here. Out in the desert mountains, it is much easier. Uh, the biggest thing that I have to deal with out there is uh, now pigs and uh, rodents, and they will chew through things. So glass bottles take care of the rodent issue. Um, I have 55 gallon drums that used to be okay. That used to be all I need 55 gallon drums to put supplies inside of the pigs are starting to flip those, like throw them up in the air. And I've got a few where they've actually put the tusk through the 55 gallon drum. I haven't been able to open those things up yet, but they have opened up the number 10 can. So, you know, a big number 10 can of peaches, a gallon can of peaches. They've been able to bust that open and just, just to have a pig think enough to know that if they got through that metal, there'd be food. I don't understand. There's no, there's no substance on those cans to make them know that there's something in there worth fighting for that much. So that's, that's your big hurdles. You'd have to put it up in a tree, up in a rock cairn to keep it out of the, out of the pigs and then secure it with metal or glass to make sure the rodents can't get into it. And that's, that's your two main bar barriers. Not very many insects, Almost no mold at all. It's so easy to dehydrate everything and smoke everything out there in the desert mountains because humidity is not an issue at all. Without humidity, you don't have you don't have near as much life. Uh, you know, all the creatures out there competing for everything, all the resources I have down here. Same thing goes for the microbial level. You you have germs everywhere out here. Uh, without modern day antibiotics, it'd be really hard not to get an infection and die. In, in, in West Texas and the Davis Mountains, you do have bacteria everywhere, but they don't come in the numbers and they're not they're not as varied 
as they are here because the the food opportunities are just not not as plentiful so it's it's overall a, a more sanitary and safe area Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's what you'd want to do. Um, continue to smoke salt as much as you can. There are some salt creeks all throughout Texas and the South. So if you can get a salt Creek and, and boil down salt water to get salt, I would add that to any smoking that you would do. Um, honey glazing, the same thing. If you can get your honey beehives going or find some wild hives, Honey will sit there and, and be an extremely awesome thing. It's where you get honey gla glazed ham. You know that nothing really grows in honey. But you have to sit there and, and incorporate all these things to try and preserve a little bit of meat or a little bit of food. And it it's it's really a struggle. If you're not doing this primitive, if you want to just go and bottle things in, in glass bottles and, and, and jar it up in a pressure cooker, that'll work. That'll absolutely work. But trying to do it with the primitive methods is extremely tricky when it comes to humidity. Uh, a lot of times you're going to spend more effort trying to preserve it than it would be just to try and eat it all as much as possible. So you're going to make sure what you're doing as far as preservation isn't burning more calories than, than what that food that you've just stored away could possibly give you. That's why I am now growing walnuts. I've got a half dozen of them now. Texas walnuts. I'm going to be in the Davis Mountains and I'm going to try and get as many of the little guys that come up in the creek beds every year. I'm going to dig up hopefully 100 and I'm going to bring them back down here. The ones that I've had in the last year, they're doing amazingly well. So even if I don't like walnuts or like my wife, she's allergic to walnuts, the creatures that it can support, the squirrels and everything else that would come in for the walnuts, that's a food source as well. So I'm trying to optimize a lot of the land, give it what it needs, and bring in species that can possibly, possibly uh, save our lives, hopefully. And there's there's a lot of tricks. I want to push, push, push as much as possible to optimize, but there, there are always going to be some tricks that I won't actually tell y'all. Um, we'll get into that. We'll get into that next live stream. We'll talk about deer hunting and, and everybody's plan for the, the shit hits the fan survival. Uh, tactics and uh, foraging theory, all that good stuff. We'll do that next time. I sure hope so. Uh, Bree is now a senior in college, so she's she's just not out there messing around. She has been just knocking it out. So it's it's not that she hasn't been around; she has been. But when she comes down here to the ranch, it's like recovery mode. She's got to eat some of Shauna's uh, banana pudding. She's got to eat some home home cooking. She has to get some sleep, and then she's back to the grind. So she is out there doing absolutely fantastic, amazing things. We'll see what we can do about next year. I think it's going to be next year before she can come up and breathe for a moment. So we'll see. We'll see where that goes. I would like to see her come out. Um, when it comes to what I was hinting about with network TV, being out here doing some episodes with me and whatnot, uh, Bree was in those episodes. So those of you that are that are wanting to see Bree out there doing something amazing, uh, give it four, five, six months, and you'll get your wish. I'll have again. I've just got to keep on teasing you guys. I'll have more information when they release me from the NDA, and I can tell you all about the awesomeness that was that was all right so it was it was cool it was absolutely fantastic the the wooden knife handled buoy that i talked about earlier the one that i thought would be just like the buoy that i have uh i actually gave that away and you'll see where that went so that was that was gifted so pretty awesome uh i got one i got one more thing that i wanted to i forgot for the mail call all right so Y'all tell me what you think about this. Check this out. Now, this came in the mail uh, months ago, months ago. And this came from the Hollingsworth clan. All right, this is an amazing family. Talked to the guy quite a bit. Good guy, good doctor. Uh, and this is the survival bushcraft knife that he sent me, which is an absolutely awesome thing. 
So if y'all have any knives y'all want me to review, I'll be reviewing this one. Uh, I would love to see what y'all have. Um, I am a knife guy for sure. I don't have very many, but the ones I have, I take care of quite a bit. So undoubtedly, a few of you are going to just go, oh, gah. But look, look at this monster. All right. This is different. This is a very, very different knife than what I'm used to. I'm used to little skinners, uh, like Green Rivers, or or my big guy. So y'all want kind of a side by side. There's the difference there. Y'all see that? Quite a bit of difference, right? From my big knife. Now, the the double angle there. I judged this thing pretty harshly when I saw it. I did. I guarantee you I did. I thought all kinds of things. How are you going to sharpen that? It kind of looks weird. I mean, it looks it looks cool, but I'm all about functionality, right? And it's a, it's a very it's a very meaty blade, and I appreciate the meaty blades. Okay? I thought this was going to be ridiculous. I used this a few weeks back, and it's not ridiculous. It really isn't. So the front profile of this blade worked like an ulu. So you put your hand back there however you want to, and you can work all the way through whatever animal you're going after. This secondary level right here, I thought that that was just ridiculous until I actually used it. So as I was taking the skin off, I'd pull the skin back, get that edge, and come down. That would catch right there on the edge, on the skin, right where I was parting it. And I could go all the way down and pull all the way down without messing up the meat at all. It was, it acted like a gut hook. It acted a heck of a lot better than a gut hook. I've never gotten a gut hook to really work that well. Um, this thing just, it, it surprised the heck out of me. I, I would not have imagined that. I has got a bone saw on the back. I imagine that'll come in handy somewhere. I don't use bone saws. I just go for, uh, I go for cartilage. I go for whatever it's called. Your joints. Joints. I'll just go in for the joints and do that. Uh, I don't cut deer, deer legs off or anything like that. I, I cut the joints out and do it that way. So I don't hack at stuff. I don't chip up my knife or have bone fragments everywhere. But uh, it's got three holes going down it. I'm guessing for securing it to various things. Not a bad deal, especially if you want to put a lanyard on there. It does have a patina. It was beautiful and shiny. And I went and skinned things and I put it next to the sink to clean it up and clean the blood off. And my beautiful wife went and put it in the sink water and left it overnight overnight in the sink water without me knowing it. With wooden scales. So, uh, yeah, oops. So, um, she's, she, needs, she needs some advice in the comment section on what not to do with awesome knives. So uh, it, it looks better than it did. Knock the rust off. It'll start the patina up. It had to happen at some point. People that have shiny knives, I don't really trust them anyway. Right? Don't trust don't trust a uh, skinny cook. Don't trust shiny knives. So I like it. It is it is something else. So that's that's kind of uh, my humbling experience there. Because I, I did not expect at all to be surprised in that way. Um, a lot of times we look at a blade and we'll judge it, and rightly so. There are some dumb blades out there. But at other times, you can see features on there and until you really get it in your hand and try it out, um, there's, there's just no, no telling. So I do have several, several dozen javelinas on the property that moved in uh, the last two months. Javelinas, uh, collar peccaries, what you want to call them. A lot of people just shoot them and kill them and leave them. It's not, it's a game animal. That's illegal for one. And they taste amazing. I think the big thing is that they look at the pack or the, the group or the, the herd or whatever you want to call it of javelinas, the, the family group. And they see the giant old nasty grizzly grandfather and they go, I'm going to get the trophy. And they shoot that nasty, nasty animal. And then they try and eat granddaddy. Granddaddy tastes nasty, okay? Don't don't shoot the nasty, crusty javelina and then be upset that it tastes like nasty, crusty javelina. Okay? 
They don't mean any harm. I've had lots of conversations with them. I've hung out with them. I've, I've, I've had run-ins with them. I've had standoffs with them. Um, but they're just, they're just wanting to live their lives as well. So I'm going to see about going and hunting uh, one of those on the channel, this channel, Barely Survival, and skinning it up and see how that flies. Um, most folks don't have experience with javelinas. Their hair is like porcupine quills, so it really dulls knives quickly. So I'll show you how that knife's working and how my knife works on those creatures. And then we'll do, uh, we'll do some cooking with javelina. If y'all have any options or ideas on how y'all would like to see me cook the javelina, throw it in the comment section, guys. Knock it out. But uh, beautiful animals, awesome animals, 60 pounds worth of meat. And uh, I have a lot of respect for them. But it's, it's something that not everybody gets a chance to hunt. And they're doing quite well this year, so I'm I'm happy with that. Very happy with that. Wes Ash wants to know what the diversity of fish is like in the creek right now. In 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 the creek here. Yeah. All right. So we we set we set traps. Everything's moving real slow. The creek was about to go dry. I think about to. The creek was like down to about a third of its a third of its water. Still had plenty of water in it. Just wasn't running. And then we got like four inches of rain. So the creek is up and it's running and it's gorgeous and beautiful. And that's what I'm going to do part of my video on tomorrow. Um, the traps have a few crawdads in them that are just moving in slow-mo. They're just like this. It's cold water. And uh, the rest of it, cichlids, bluegill, and catfish. A ton of little catfish this big all over the place. I haven't caught any plecos or anything yet. A few minnows here and there, but it, it should be interesting. If if the creek doesn't go dry, and it probably won't go dry this year, the crawdad season's going to be a little different because I usually get the, the huge harvest of crawdads because the creek goes dry for a few weeks. That kills all the predator fish. The water comes back up, and the crawdads just go nuts. They're, they're just everywhere, and they do really well because nothing's out there eating them. So we'll see what what comes of it this year for those of you that have seen the crawdad trap videos you have kind of a baseline because it it gets pretty wild sometimes so we'll see what the difference is this year with with it not going dry so again every season is different you never know what resources are going to be available or not available patrick phillips wants to know how often you fill your feeders the feeders uh i have so I don't like feeding. I don't. I don't like filling them up very often. They're on one to two seconds twice a day. That's it. And I run. Uh, I've got a fifty-five gallon feeder. I've got some smaller feeders down by the river. Um. So. Once a month, somewhere around once a month. It it really depends on how much the wind blows because some of these feeders, it'll spin the spinner with the wind. And it'll let the, the corn go out faster, or I get some kind of acrobatic uh, raccoon that's able to, to, to foil my, my plans of keeping them away. But uh, I'd say every three, three weeks to a month is when we have to go ahead and put more corn in the feeders. And I've got a few friends that come out, and they, they buy corn and put them out in the feeders, too. We feed year-round. We take care of our creatures. They don't need it, especially in the spring and summer. But uh, it's it's nice to have that resource for them, especially if there was a bad year. So it's not bad. Uh, what's your favorite tool in your shop? That's a good question. Probably this. Probably this thing. The the Ferdinand Bull. This giant 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 machine. I mean, I've got some good hole punchers that I'm, I'm really, I really like. I, I do a lot of things with uh, brass rivets, so I have rivet setters that I, that I really prefer, uh, edgers and things that I use all the time. But as far as leather shop tool, this is, this is the heavy hitter. So it's, it's about 200 pounds. Uh, this came from a former scoutmaster. I don't know how much y'all can see of this thing. Uh, he had a leather shop that he acquired. Um, he and he and uh, he and myself, we took care of of a gentleman that had a leather shop, and he he passed away from cancer. And then we took care of his his wife for a while. 
And uh, whenever she wanted to sell it, we got the opportunity to buy it. And so I spent several years going through college, coming out to the leather shop in the evenings and learning and, and having, having Ed say, that looks ugly. <laughs> that, that's terrible. What are you, what are you building? That is absolutely just, just horrible. Why would you build something so ugly in my shop? And so that's that's how that went as I learned how to to put things together and he slowly schooled me on how to put things together. Um about 7 8 years ago he decided to move and he was moving on with various things and he gave me the opportunity to buy this one machine and quite a few of the tools at at a heck of a sale price. So I picked this thing up and it is my workhorse big time. So fires up I don't know if y'all can hear the, the motors fire up right there. Foot feed pedal. It'll go through a one inch of leather without without really complaining. And uh, it does a lot of the work out here. So I do a lot of hand stitching, a lot of hand sewing. But when I can get away with it, I knock it out with this. Uh, hand sewing is always going to be stronger than what this can do. But uh, as, far as, as far as being able to throw stitches in straight. Ooh. That's that's what this machine did a few weeks back. And those stitches were done by me. So if, if they look jacked up, that's because it's by me. But if they look awesome, it's because it's, it's by me. Um, the machine sits there and straightens everything out and make it look, makes it look really, really pretty. And the foot feed brings it down and it works real well. But this is the new shoeing bag for the trail shoeing kit for one of the cavalcades, the horseback treks. So the Wranglers... Have a, I have a hammer in here, a file, a bunch of nails, horseshoes, and a few other pieces of tools and equipment for fixing saddles. But this is how we put shoes back on, on the trail, out there on the trail. So shoes come off, and that's how we put them back on. We take everything we need for a week at a time with us. Um, once we leave base camp, that, that's it. We are self-reliant self, self, uh, self -reliant completely. That, that's number 230. All right. I'm going to give you all about eight, nine, ten more minutes, guys. And then call tonight because I've got to get up early, early in the morning. Are they are they getting tired of me yet? No, yeah. What's the favorite thing to make flour from or the closest thing to a wheat flour? Uh, okra. Okra is amazing. So the more you do this stuff with, with primitive food you find that a lot of it is extremely labor intensive. Like it takes a lot of time to sit there and, and get it where it needs to go to make it into food. But if you're out there for a little while and you, you've, uh, you, you've got your little garden or whatever, especially down here in Texas, okra, you throw it up there, you start clipping it off, clip it off. Once it gets full grown, clip it off. You can, you can grow so much okra in a month or two, way more than you can ever, ever eat. And all the dried okra just dries on its own, splits open on its own. It takes two seconds to break open an okra and dump all the, the hard seeds out into a container. And they crush up real easy into flour. Like as far as from field to prep, it is just it is just too easy. Absolutely too easy. So okra, okra's my go-to. A lot of other seeds will work. And there's a lot of analogous things that you can do, but uh, you get to the point where you've got to make that decision. I mean, flour is really something that you, you're you already set up on. I mean, you have your food stores. I guess you have a lot of time in the evenings or something because flour, even if it's coming from okra, is going to be labor intensive. Can I take those same seeds, crush them a little bit? and then put them in a gruel, and then boil that gruel, just keep on boiling it, boiling it, boiling it, I absolutely can. Uh, flour's more of a texture thing. I mean, you can get some, some, some different things out of it. It'll definitely help with food fatigue, but you can make flour out of potatoes. You can make flour out of, I mean, our, our analog to potatoes out here is a wine cup. So I can make flours out of wine cup, flour out of wine cup. I can make flours out of bean. So, but I've got to crush up the beans. And so you've got to find a way to make sure that you're not burning more calories than what you're getting out of that resource. So 
it, it all kind of depends on where you are on the survival scale. That makes sense. Uh, I, I've never done it. I've never done it. Um, can I make... You're going to make me do it. All right. Next spring, I will make alcohol out of an agave. How about that? I should have several of them that have the sugar content necessary to do that. Can I make tequila out of it? I don't know. Um, because there there's some extra steps and some extra instrumentation that it requires to proof that alcohol that high and to make it clear like that and to make it into to, to tequila or mezcal or whatever you want to make it into. Um, but I can definitely make an alcoholic mash that'll set you back on your butt. I can do that. Fermentation's pretty straightforward. I can ferment quite a few things and, and really uh, really put on a party even out here in nature. It only takes six, seven days to get a real good fermentation down for a wine or something. So six, seven days and you've got alcohol. Uh, if you want to talk survival, especially pre prepping, one of the biggest things you hear about folks in the, in, the, in the old days, alcohol was served at every meal. The same thing goes, guys, if you're going to set up with all your cans of Spam and all your MREs and all of your grain storage and everything else like that, you ought to have an entire wall of cheap wine, of ales and cheap wines, things that are going to stay, stay, stick around for 20, 30, 40, 100 years and be fine. Learn how to store them so the cork doesn't dry out, all that good stuff. But food fatigue and then being able to supplement your calories with everything that you put in your mouth ought to be, ought to be calorie rich. And alcohol is one of those things. And once you've drank the alcohol out of those core boys, uh, out of those wine bottles... You keep those wine bottles in next season with what you're growing, because I have Dublanc uh, and wild little grapes growing out in the forest right now. Really excited about the Dublanc. Um, you can make more wine out of whatever kind of natural fruits you have out of there, or whatever kinds of uh, whatever whatever kind of fruit trees you have out and around your area. So you can ferment whatever you have in excess of what you pick out of the forest. So wine bottles are important. It's even better if you start a survival or prepper prepper situation with the wine bottles already full. So uh, think about it. And this is one of those times from the, the fruity girl wines. The fruity wines, I drink them all the time, all right? So call it, call it what it is. I like the fruity stuff. I like all the wine. Um, but uh, with the higher sugar content, you're going to get more out of it. That's just what it is. So consider that. An entire wall of wine, I would I would say that that needs to be part of folks' prepper prepper unit for sure. Um, I would go for that always. What are your thoughts on making cheese? <sighs> I live in South Texas. Um, I've never done it. I never have. Um, as a biology teacher, as a survivalist. I know that cheese is one of those cheese and dairy products is one of those things that 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 really changed the world that allowed folks to eat through the winter time and and get the fats they need because we're all we're all fat deficient when it comes to the winter time the animals are starving they're running out of fat we're eating the animals that don't have enough fat it's definitely something that we have to work at Protein's fine. Protein's everywhere. Fat is what you need. Calories is what you need. So cheese, cheese makes up a whole bunch when it comes there. If if I was really worried about things, I imagine I'd go get some goats uh, and start working at the cheese thing. Milk at the very least, but I I need to. You just kind of poked a hole in what I what I do. I probably need to go and figure out more about how to make goat cheese, what the preservation is on that, how to harden it up all the physics behind what it means to make to make cheese out in survival. Just having something that makes milk every day would be ph phenomenal. Uh, we have 18 chickens right now. For the most part, they're able to forage what they need. It's gotten cold, so the insects are down. Um, all of the ants are dead. <laughs> when, 
within a couple hundred yards, all the ants are dead now. They usually don't like eating ants, but now since all the other insects are gone, the chickens have murdered all the ants. If I, if I could not go out and get grain for those chickens to get eggs every single day, which we're getting a dozen, dozen and a half eggs every day, then I would just go down to the creek and set the crawdad traps and the minnow traps and fill them up with minnows and bring the minnows on up and they'd get their protein and calorie sources from there. So I would definitely have to, to supplement, but in the summertime, springtime, they don't need anything. So there's, there's all these holes that we have to consider and try and fill up. So the walnuts are bringing in, we have about 60 fig trees that are about to go on the ground when spring comes in. I've got a few more episodes of things I want to show you there. I don't have the milk, but I have countered that with the agave. So I have enough agave where if I, I can bake one every three to four days and have all the calories that I need, all the calories that I need to, to keep my, my family moving and grooving and going. So, uh, but it's, it's definitely something I would probably need to take care of and check out, especially the calcium content after a while especially if you come to an area that, that doesn't have a whole lot of calcium. So, yeah, I, I need to do some homework then, I guess. What's your favorite primitive fire starting method and why? Primitive? Yeah. How primitive is primitive, guys? Uh, I mean, my favorite one is to find a lightning strike and go up and pick up a stick that's on fire. It's, it's super awesome. Um... My goodness. Uh, you've, you've seen me use uh, ferro rods. Those aren't primitive. Really, the, the only option that I, would, that I would like, I mean, you can sit there and you can do friction sticks, especially if you have two or three people there. With two or three people sitting in there and switching out on the same stick and everybody facing each other, you can get it going. Um, I don't like fire bows. Unless you've made a thousand of them and you don't, you don't get the physics down just right, it's just a whole bunch of frustration. You might never make something that's viable. So three people all doing that, taking, sitting there going down, that's an option. A uh, piece of steel, like my knife, finding a piece of flint, there you go. That's what I would prefer, throwing sparks. Sparks are already fire. I like that method a lot. I've made a lot of tender bundles. I've made a lot of fires that way in my hands. And that works. Really and truly, though, it's the 21st century. Um, it A handful of Bic lighters, unless you're a chain smoker, unless you're a chain smoker, you smoke a lot, has anybody ever used a lighter up? I mean, I think it's happened to me once where I used a Bic lighter up. If you've got your nest ready and you take a Bic lighter, you go, Chk, and you have flame for one, two seconds, and your fire started. My calculations, that's like 5,000 to 6,000 fires per Bic lighter. So there, there are ways to be prepared to make sure that that's not a consideration. Um, I love coming back to the, the primitive ways and knowing how to do so. But uh, past that, past knowing it and keeping the skills fresh and being able to practice here and there, it's a cool trick. Be prepared. Number one, be prepared as much as possible, right? So number one tool, look at that. That is your best survival tool. No, I'm just kidding. Y'all know what that is? This is the last thing I'm gonna sign off on. I found this thing, found this thing last year. Uh, my family used to go gold dredging in Alaska. We, had a, we have a floating gold dredge. For some reason in Texas, I have a 12 foot long floating gold dredge, a big sucker with a six inch input. A big Bering Sea gold dredge is in my barn and has been since 89, 90. Okay, still there. Looks great. This was shoved inside of, uh, inside of one of the, I forget what they're called. It's where the water goes through to collect the gold. All right. This old thing. Y'all remember that? I think everybody had that in the 80s and 90s. That went to Alaska. I remember it in Alaska. That was uh, that was another uncle's brilliance. It's got the uh, the ever present north, south, east, west on the bottom. It's got a kind of a junky uh, what's it called knife sharpener stuck on there. 
and inside you have all of, all of the necessities. So I, I don't know. Some cigarettes. Uh, I just dropped some stuff. Some weights, some hooks, some some uh, some fire starting material in there. But I think everybody had this. Um, and I don't imagine, I imagine everybody sitting there nodding their head right now. For that one person that's not nodding their head and they go to their Jordan, they're like, this is my prized possession and you have one of these? Stop. Stop it. It's going to hurt you. It's not good. It's not full tang. Buy full tang always. This is not full tang. Don't. All right? Don't do it. It is the Rambo knife. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It brings back memories, right? Everybody had to buy one of these things. The only necessary item on it is the bottle opener. Maybe the matches. I think there's, there's undoubtedly a few people that have had this in the past that have tried to open a bottle and the darn blade is broken off of it. You know it's true. It's like tack welded onto this tang right here. To the tang guard so i don't know what happened to the uh i don't know what happened to the the compass now it's all out of water you can just about throw that 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 compass at somebody and do something with it all right y'all ready for time capsule this is kind of work if i could see huh all right all right all right so I didn't know that was in there. Snare? Or maybe they use that as a, a saw? It's like wire with some nuts on it. I don't know. What do y'all think? What else we get? Ow, something sharp. All right. Got, got a clothespin. Several clothespins stuck in me. Oh, that's hooks. We have some monofilament line. Still good to go. Got some weights that I'm dropping on the floor. We'll put back. Huh? Of course <laughs> My wife's hanging out the back door of the lab of the of the deal. And the horses just came up and scared her a little bit. More hooks. How much I, I don't know how I'm supposed to start this fire. Okay, okay. There's a piece of there's a piece of deal around it. The rubber band is not going to be functional ever again. <laughs> they said that fresh one was a saw. Was it a saw? Yeah. It's, it's a really fine saw. All right. And here's the strike. Strike only on certain things and the strike anywhere thing. Oh, man. Look at that. <laughs> I didn't expect that to actually work. Those are... 30 plus years old. Half Bean says he'd do a video with that knife given the chance. It's all yours, Half Bean. But when it breaks off and stabs you in the face, I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know. All right, guys. I think, uh, think y'all are probably tired of me. Give me some advice on this. I've got to get better and learn how to do this because I want to do it more. If y'all have a certain day or night that y'all would like me to do this or a certain time, your input would be very valuable. When it comes to summer, I'll be up on top of the mountains, so I won't be able to do it on a certain day. But I'll still be up on top of the mountains. So every once in a while I hit a peak, I'll check in with y'all once a week up on top of the mountains, on top of my mule or my horse and give y'all an update and give you a beautiful view in an absolutely amazing place and show you what's going on and, and uh, you can check out my tan. Um, we'll work on that for sure. Uh, any kind of things that you'd like me to talk about, throw them down in the comment section. <clears throat> I'll get a whiteboard up here after a while and I'll make sure that I can write those down and talk to y'all. But any kind of input that y'all can give in the comment section, throw it down there. We'll read all of it because I could... I could use I could use anything, anything y'all have. Um, if there's a certain way that y'all would like me to present myself, I think next week I'm probably going to go ahead and do this on top of a horse. 
some of y'all know my one-eyed horse, Joga. I haven't ridden him in like three or four years, so I'm going to go ahead and saddle him up and do a live stream on top of him. And at that point, I won't be able to have Shauna reading comments because I'll be going through the forest. So if y'all give me topics that I can cover while I'm on top of Joga, shoot them at me, right? For those of you that donated, guys, thank y'all so much. Y'all making this thing possible as far as the projects back to backcountry, as far as the leather shop, uh, we should be getting saddlebags in here in a few weeks the, to repair rebuild for the camp coming this spring and that helps out so buckles uh leather i've got 50 saddles to take care of and make sure that i've got re-upped re ready for the summer if you want to go riding or as i talked about earlier if you're just coming on go back earlier on the video if you want to come out to the work weekend and have just the time of your life to be in a place that is unimaginably beautiful down in the slot canyon with water flowing through the place i i don't know it's it's so beautiful that i dream about it come out come be part of it send me some messages the the uh email is bob hamsler at yahoo.com so shoot, shoot me some messages if y'all have any more tools for leather shop if you have any tools for shoeing horses send them this way if you have any old scraps of leather any of the buckles and hardware Guys, send them this way. Uh, I've got a couple more things that have been mailed to me. I'll have to show y'all next time. But even a lady named Sherry Ball sent a saddlebag and a whole bunch of thread and stuff that I can send out on trail now. So the Wranglers now have the wax thread that they need and some backup material and some other stuff that will keep them together because things break. They only, they don't only break when you get in base camp. They break when you're out there in the middle of that stuff. And so me getting the Wranglers... A lot of these guys are starving kids, like 18, 19 years old. They don't have the money. So y'all have a tactical flashlight, I'll put it in their hands. If y'all have a Leatherman, I'll put it in their hands. All the things that I know that when I was 18, I couldn't afford, or if I had, I would cherish. I'm going to try and get them what they need so that they're prepared out on the trail for whatever, whatever happens. So the first aid kit gets completely stocked. They have the tools. They have everything they need. And that they are trained. And that is that is what I want to make sure is happening. So adventures abound. More videos to come. I've got to get some good sleep tonight because I've got a video to post. Or, or not to post. To shoot tomorrow. And uh, guys, thank you all so much for coming and watching this channel. Uh, check out my Patreon. You Patreons are amazing. Thank you all that have, that have sent money on PayPal to my, my email address. I very much appreciate that. Especially knowing what everybody's been through uh, this year. So please take care. Please be safe. Please like, subscribe. And as always, you know, till next time, I'll be good, Goop. I can't even see. All right.